Hey everyone, it's Peter from Theme Park Crazy, and I've been doing this for about eight years. That is a long time, but it feels like just yesterday that I started this channel. Believe it or not, all the way back in 2017, when they announced that Stinger would be closing at Dorney Park, I had this idea of making a video where I ranked my favorite defunct coasters that I've ridden. The only problem was, I really wanted it to be a top 10, but I hadn't ridden 10 defunct coasters. Nowadays though, I've ridden more than 10, and I thought it would be fun to take a look back and rank the best defunct coasters that I've ever been on. Number 10 is Apocalypse at Six Flags America. This ride has since been turned into Firebird, and honestly, I haven't been on it, but I've heard nothing but bad things about it. That said, I really do remember enjoying Apocalypse when I first rode it. Back then I was part of a coaster club and we had gotten there early in the morning and we were able to get exclusive ride time on Apocalypse so I actually rode this a few times in a row. And honestly for the first roller coaster that B&M has ever built, it was pretty good. I thought it had a decent layout, it was pretty smooth, and I also thought the post-apocalyptic theming around it was pretty cool. Now, it wasn't the best stand-up coaster I've ever ridden, that honor would still have to go to Riddler's Revenge at Six Flags Magic Mountain, but it was definitely nowhere near as bad as Vortex at Carowinds. I guess just the experience of being there early in the morning and getting to check out this ride with, like, no lines, that may have made me a bit biased towards it, but I definitely have some good memories riding this. Next up is the ride that inspired the very idea of this video, Stinger at Dorney Park. This was a Vacoma in Vertigo model. This is basically just an inverted boomerang. You go up a reverse lift and you're sent down through a cobra roll and a vertical loop before doing the whole thing backwards. Now what's interesting about the Invertigo model is that you could sit in either direction. So you could start off the layout going forwards or backwards. Although at the time I said that it was a bit of a quote unquote headbanger, I've definitely ridden worse since I rode that. Honestly, I wouldn't even put it in the top 20 worst coasters I've been on. It was honestly a pretty decent ride. It had some nice g-forces, it was pretty intense, and it was a nice little addition to the park's lineup. Since then, it's been replaced with Iron Menace, which just opened this year, so it took a while for that replacement to come. And I'll be sure to head out there and check out Iron Menace soon. But as for Stinger, it was a fun little ride that I thought got a lot of unnecessary hate at the time. Another ride that I thought got some unnecessary hate was Primeval Whirl at Disney's Animal Kingdom. This was a pair of spinning wild mouse coasters by French manufacturer Reverchon. And I will agree, this section of the park was extremely tacky for a Disney park. It really didn't scream, this is Disney Imagineering's best. It just felt like it was a victim of budget cuts. And I know that in a lot of ways it was supposed to be a tribute to the old roadside attractions. But it's one of those instances where you think, wow, Disney could have done a lot better than this. That said, I did enjoy this area as a kid. I thought it was colorful and fun, and I really liked dinosaurs like a lot of kids did. And when I got to ride this coaster in 2003, I honestly had a lot of fun on it. This was the first time I had ever ridden any sort of Wild Mouse coaster. Now the main selling point of the Wild Mouse coaster is the use of hairpin turns in its layout. So when your vehicle approaches the turns, you think that, for a split second, you're gonna fly right off the track. And I definitely got this impression as a kid. It felt very unpredictable, but I thought it was a fun time through and through. It's true that there are plenty of spinning wild mouse coasters out there, and they're not my favorite rides as of now. I mean, I'm older and I can't really spin as much without Dramamine. But as an 11 year old, this was just one of the coasters that really got me interested in being an enthusiast. I certainly don't regret riding it, and a part of me actually misses it. Now again, I completely understand why Disney is replacing this land, and hopefully the new Tropical Americas theme section will be really good. Overall though, definitely some great memories on Primeval Whirl. Number 7 is a ride that just closed this year, Scorpion at Busch Gardens Tampa. I was actually really disappointed when I found out this ride was closing. First of all, it feels like a lot of Schwarzkopf coasters have been closing lately. And that's unfortunate because I really enjoy how forceful the loops on these rides are. And second, I thought this was a cute, nice little coaster for the park. It didn't stand out compared to like Kumba or Montu or Shikra, and it wasn't as epic as those rides, but it was still a fun little appetizer for the rest of the park's lineup. 
Moreover, it was the first time that I did an inversion without any over the shoulder harnesses. It really gave me a good idea of how centrifugal force works in person. And when I first rode this, I was like, wow, I'm going through a loop without anything on my shoulders. This is surreal. Yeah, thinking that may be silly nowadays, but as a 13 year old, it was something that I had never experienced before. Definitely sad to see this ride leaving, but hopefully its replacement will be up to par. From one inversion to six, we're heading to number six, which is Vortex at King's Island. Now, this may not have been the smoothest ride ever, but I'm still very glad I got to experience it. Sure, at the time I was critical of it, calling it a jaw banger and saying that it wasn't smooth enough, but over the years I've developed a soft spot for these old aero coasters. With a couple of exceptions, they haven't really been that painful, not nearly as painful enough to have me overlook the historical value they have. And Vortex definitely had historical value. It was the first coaster ever built to have six inversions, and it put King's Island on the map. Hell, you could check out my video about Vortex in the description if you want. And to tell you the truth, I'm sure that if I went back in time right now to ride Vortex, I would probably like it a lot more than I did when I rode it in 2017. I love the first drop, it has a great mix of inversions, and it just had this massive epic feel to it. And aside from that, this coaster was just beautiful to look at. I actually took a few photos of it, and they're some of the best photos I've taken in my opinion. I'm just so thankful I got to experience this coaster firsthand and collect these images of it, and I feel that these pictures really emphasize how loved this coaster was by the park's fans. Nowadays, we're still waiting on the replacement and hopefully it will be built soon, but if I could go back in time and ride this coaster, I would definitely do it at least one more time. Coming in at number 5 is another King's Island coaster, Firehawk. Now I've been fortunate enough to ride all three Vekoma Flying Dutchmans ever built. And out of all of them, I honestly have to say that Firehawk was my favorite. Granted, these coasters aren't as smooth or graceful as the B&M Flyers. It was kind of odd to board the coaster and go up the hill in a laydown position. But it was pretty unique and definitely a different ride experience that I enjoyed quite a bit. Out of all of the Flying Dutchman coasters, I thought that Firehawk was easily the smoothest. And like with other flying coasters, I just love the experience of riding in a face down position. You really did feel like you were flying on this one. Now this ride did close back in 2018 and would be replaced with Orion, which is one of my favorite coasters ever. Unfortunately though, Firehawk would be scrapped for good. Now it's understandable that the remaining Flying Dutchman coasters would want the parts from this, and it's unlikely that a park would want to buy a discontinued coaster that doesn't have a lot of available parts for it. But in terms of quality, this one was definitely the best of the three. On the subject of Ohio, we have a couple more coasters from there coming up. Yep, almost half the coasters on this list are from Ohio. And no, I'm not going to make any more Sigma references. No Rizzes either. What I will do is introduce number four, which is Wicked Twister at Cedar Point. This was a large, massive shuttle coaster that had a very simple layout. It didn't have any inversions, and all you did was go back and forth up two twisting spikes of track. It seemed pretty simple, and when I first rode it, I didn't really appreciate it compared to the rest of the park's lineup. But absence does make the heart grow fonder, and I actually got to ride this the year it closed in 2021. That year, I had some great rides on it. I loved how forceful the launches were, I loved getting to the top of the spike while looking down or looking up, I did both sides, and it felt like I was enjoying a piece of history while it was still around. I loved getting all sorts of photos and videos of it, and now I have those videos and photos to use whenever I need them. I also love the fact that I went around the time they started putting up the Halloween decorations, and there was actually a dabbing skeleton statue in front of Wicked Twister. Which really summed up this ride. Like, this ride was gonna die, but it was gonna go out in style. So that was fun to check out. Sure, it was overshadowed by the rest of Cedar Point's A-list attractions, but I will miss seeing those big yellow spikes of track the next time I go to Cedar Point. They just looked really nice in the park skyline. And speaking of Cedar Point, Top Thrill Dragster is number three. Now you might be thinking, wait a minute, this ride is still technically standing. Well yes, but it's not the same ride. 
I understand that Top Thrill 2 didn't exactly have the greatest opening year. It was only open for like a week and then it had to close down due to issues with the wheel supposedly. Definitely not something that the park or Zamperla wanted to happen, but unfortunately that's what happens when you go with new prototypes. There's always a risk when it comes to innovation. Anyway, when it comes to the original Top Thrill Dragster, I did make a video, a quote failed coasters video on that ride. And that's not to say this coaster was a failure, unless you're Dick Kinzel, the former CEO of Cedar Fair, in which case he agrees that it was a big mistake due to the costs and due to the downtime of the ride. And when I went to Cedar Point for the first time in 2018, this ride was indeed down for most of my visit. Surprisingly though, it wasn't down as much as Millennium Force was because there was apparently an issue with the lift cable. So as a result, I only got to ride Millennium Force and Top Thrill Dragster once in my three day trip there. But still, once is better than none. And I have to say, this ride definitely lived up to the hype. I may have only ridden it once, but I remember it so well. Now since it's closer to home, I've definitely ridden Kinga Ka at Six Flags Great Adventure more times than this. But I will agree with a lot of people in saying that Top Thrill Dragster was the superior ride experience. The reason being is that while King Naka had over the shoulder restraints, Top Thrill Dragster just had a lap bar. Yep, just a lap bar when you're going at 120 miles per hour and cresting that massive 420 foot top hat. It was just awesome and the view you got at the top of Lake Geary was unbeatable. It just felt so much more intense and fun than King Naka did because of its open restraint system. Honestly, I will really miss that intense hydraulic launch. Even though I've heard that the new magnetic launch in the week that Top Thrill 2 was open was very good as well. Hopefully they'll get Top Thrill 2 fully operational by next year and I can go down and check it out, but I'll still miss that yellow and pink version. And yes, I know that the pink track was originally red when it first opened, but I don't know, yellow and pink just go together very well. Maybe it's like a Spongebob and Patrick thing, I don't know. At number two is a ride that's technically also still open, but is vastly different from the original, though not as much different as Top Thrill 2. And this ride is Lightning Rod at Dollywood. Originally, when this ride first opened, as I explained in my failed coasters video of this ride, it had an LSM launch system to take you up that first hill. This made it the world's only launched wooden coaster. Now sure, I didn't ride this coaster when it first opened. When it first opened in 2016, they didn't turn off the launch towards the top of the hill, so you went flying over it. And this apparently caused a lot of structural issues, so they later adjusted the launch so that it turned off towards the top to put less stress on the track, apparently. So I didn't get that big pop of airtime that a lot of people praise, but still, this was an awesome ride with that launch. You just go through the trees, across that hilly terrain, it really uses the terrain to its advantage. And I will say, this is one of the best terrain coasters I've ever ridden, if not the best. Now it may not have inversions, but it's got insane, and I mean like INSANE, in all caps, ejector airtime. My favorite airtime moment is definitely that classic quadruple down towards the end. Like, you just get flung out of your seat over and over and over again. It's just awesome. Unfortunately, they decided last year that the launch was too troublesome and caused too much downtime to keep around, so they have since replaced it with a high-speed chain lift. Now, I've heard a lot of people say that the ride, as a whole, is just as good as it was. Still, though, I will miss that launch. It really made this ride stand out. That's not to say that, oh, it's terrible without the launch, but I still really admired it as a unique innovation. It didn't go that well considering the ride's downtime, but still, you really gotta give credit to RMC for trying something new. But now, let's move on to number one, and this is definitely my favorite of the bunch, Dueling Dragons at Islands of Adventure. Wow, I mean, I gotta say, when I first rode this in 2003, I was blown away. I had never been on a ride that dueled to the extent that this one did. It was also my first ever B&M inverted coaster, so I got to experience having nothing under my feet for the first time ever. The way the two trains interacted with each other when this ride first opened, all the flyby effects, those were just awesome. As was the moment with the two vertical loops where it looks like you're about to crash head on into the other train, but you just go up and upside down just before you hit them. 
And aside from those moments, I never experienced a ride with inversions this intense before. Sure, I've been on the Incredible Hulk at the same park, and that does have more inversions, but the inverted trains made the inversions feel a lot more intense. I can actually remember when I got off the ride for the first time, I took a look at the track and saw the insane twists it was doing, and I was literally like, did I do that? Eventually, when this whole area was rethemed to Hogsmeade, this ride became Dragon Challenge, and at first, it did still duel. I actually remember getting a dueling ride on it in early 2011. But around that same time, there was this really bad injury where apparently a shoe fell off of someone's foot and hit a guy in the face and caused him to lose his eyeball. And the park, and I'm sure its insurance provider, realized that it was too dangerous to keep around with the risk of loose items falling onto other guests. So, unfortunately, they had to disable the dueling feature. And up until 2017, it operated as two separate coasters, which were still fun, but nowhere near as fun as when it had that dueling feature. I can actually remember my last ride, it was in 2017, and I had ridden the Chinese fireball part, the red track, and then shortly after I got off the ride, or a while after, I think the line was really long, so I went to do other things and then I came back later. But when I came back, it started just pouring rain. And unfortunately, I decided that I couldn't stick around and I had to leave the park because it was almost closing time. So I was going to have to pass on that coaster for the day. But something in me told me that I had to experience that coaster before I left. And even though my flight was the next day, I actually bought another ticket to come back and ride the Hungarian Horntail part. And that would end up being my last ride on this coaster, so I'm really glad I did that in hindsight. Now, I will agree that Hagrid's Motorbike Adventure is a very worthy successor, an amazing coaster, incredible theming. But I'll always have, you know, a longing for Dragon Challenge, or rather, Dueling Dragons, the OG title. This was the best defunct coaster I've ever ridden by far. Now it's time for the comment shoutout program. This is where I take five random comments from my previous video and read them out. These comments come from my video on 2025 roller coasters. GamerBoss40YT says, I'm excited for Stardust Racers, Raptera, and Alpenfury. Rash Monroe says, The other two coasters for Epic Universe look great too. Ellie Shakensella 1934 says, Peppa Pig tripped on a wire, fell in a fire, bacon strips. Simon Snowclock 5937 says, That double steel racing coaster is so exciting to me. It looks like something that I grew up considering an engineering marvel on Roller Coaster Tycoon 2. Genuinely stoked to see something like that coming to life. And Simon Pup 12 VI 5 TP says, Forget Goliath at Six Flags New England, bring back Shipwreck Falls lol. Unreal not, it's my home park and I'm excited for Quantum Accelerator. If you want to see your words in my next video, leave a comment down below and it may be selected. Please note though that inflammatory or spam comments will not be read. Now before we wrap things up, I want to give a special shout out to my newest Patreon supporters. Verbal shoutouts start at the hyper tier, and if you're interested in supporting me on Patreon, I put a link in the description. Here's a special shoutout to Alex Inza, Keegan Held, and Zip. Thank you all so much. Your support is crucial to the future of this channel. Thank you all so much, and if you want to support me on Patreon, you can do so once again at the link in the description. Thanks for watching everyone, feel free to like, share, and subscribe. You can follow me on social media on Instagram and Facebook, or you can check out my website at themeparkcrazy.com. And I'm on TikTok. This is Theme Park Crazy, and I'll see you all next time.